payment was what to call up with. Yes, we have Adele and we're going to have her share with us about African Ewa and African Ewa just turned two guys. Um, we actually attended their session yesterday where they were celebrating their two year anniversary. They've been doing this thing for two years. And I just want to say, yeah, congratulations. And we expect uh, to grow big with you and to see where we are all going to go in the future. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, meeting. Um, I hope everyone is well. And for us, it's, it's always an absolute joy to share this space with a dynamic group of storytellers across the motherland. Uh, we don't take these opportunities lightly. It's always a sacred privilege to come into spaces like this and to share with the rest of you. So really honored to be here. What I want to do now is to check in with everyone. And I like it when we use this, this um, image we call the sheep scale. So I'll be sharing my screen. And I like the sheep scale because um, you get to define what it means to you. And so if you can see my screen, on the sheep scale, how are you feeling today? So that's number one to nine. And I don't know what one to nine means. Um, different people will define it as different things. So um, please put in the chat how you're feeling on the sheep scale. And possibly if you're feeling one, two, five, six, nine, what those numbers mean. If you've just joined in, I'm really excited to have you on the call. And the question is, how are you feeling today on the sheep scale? Um, you get to define for yourself the number you choose. Um, what is going on? Who is saying what and how are they saying it on the sheep scale? Right, on our sheep scale, of course, I started it off with, I put on a three there, I'm feeling a three. Uh, I have no idea what that means, but I was looking at it and the hair is all crazy and it's just like mine. So yeah. I'm having a brilliant hair day, so I was looking for one which matches my hair, and I picked that one. So I go with three for that for the hair. It's got a crazy fro, happy go lucky feeling, and that's me today. Uh, let's see. we have the emotional guru is on a nine, which is like happy for the luck and opportunities in my life, just grateful. Uh, Lazarus is feeling a six from Zambia there, and we have uh, Nana Esi with a six again, and. Interesting. Um, sheep number six beaten has got some flowers on its neck and a bell. And sometimes I feel like six when I when I feel quite pretty um, because I'm a mom of young, three young children. And quite often the day begins and ends and I've just realized, oh, I've been wearing my dressing gown all morning. So when I have opportunities to really sit up and get my hair done, I always feel like a six. And you obviously were feeling like a free, um, having a lovely hair day. <laughs> and somebody was feeling like a nine, which is, which is, which is super. Uh, basically, we have three, six, and nine. Is the, those are the lucky numbers that we have. It's almost like the same column going on there. Very interesting. <laughs> Indeed, it is interesting. And I think um, I like the energy. I want to be in the space when people are feeling like, you know, nine and things. So, yes. Um, perhaps... All of African EY is also feeling a bit like nine. And as a feeling that we wish to sustain. And Beaton, I just want to say thanks for this opportunity once more. Um, today, we've just come to share our story as a way to motivate and encourage you um, on your storytelling journey, because this is where ours started. And the many parallels we share with the community um, in Afro bloggers. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about Africa Niwa, where we started. Um, we we're two years yesterday. And for me, it was important for us to come in here and share with you our why, and then also the onerous responsibility of doing this work and where Afro bloggers came in to provide that immense support that it continues to provide. And then um, what our hopes and dreams are for the future and how you can also be part of the story. Um, so yesterday, Beaton was with us and some of you have joined us before. Um, if, you, if this is your first time encountering me, my name is Adela Santi. And yesterday I even decolonized my name, which was, which was brilliant. Um, but our journey with African Iwa would never be complete with the support we get from Afro bloggers. So this afternoon, I'm just here to tell a little story of um, how we started 
where we are now, um, where we hope to be, and where you may also join in. Um, I grew most of my formative years in, in Ghana, in West Africa. But as I grew, I also had the opportunity to travel to see other places, which was incredible. Um, and as I journey through these places, because my parent owned a business and it involved a lot of traveling, it was an importation business. So most of the holidays I'll spend time with my parents in, in the US or the UK, and we have family there as well. So I grew up seeing all these places and then I'll come back home to Ghana where I had a lot of my education and I saw I could draw a lot of parallels on the privileges I had um, to see those places. And even in those places, I also saw a lot of um, differences in the lifestyle of the people who were living in the diaspora and those who were back home. And I think all these stories and these observations were going to inform a lot of the decisions I was going to make in the future. Um, the experience is when you travel to such places and you are there for a while as a holiday maker or as a visitor, it's not quite the same when the place sometimes um, or eventually or at some point becomes your home. Now, this is a place where you are supposed to live and thrive and possibly raise a family. And so for me, everything was going to change. Um, my husband was already living in the UK when I met him here. And then we got married. We thought about a lot of things and we'll have a lot of conversations, but we really didn't prioritize that big question, where were we going to live, you know? And I had the opportunity um, um, to work in the UK and in Ghana as well, um, every time I traveled. So I spent six years of my university life as um, training um, as an optometrist. So most of what I learned in school had to do with the anatomy and the physiology of the human eye. That is all I know. I don't know anything else. And I loved it incredibly because I felt like a miracle worker. The magic when somebody's not seeing well and you do a good refraction and then they are able to read. It was just awe inspiring and I loved every bit of it. So I get married, I'm here and I, I get into the optical industry wanting to start work. It was difficult. For the first time I have to navigate as a migrant because I've not come for three months and I'm going six weeks and I'm going, this is my home now. So I'm part of a large number of people in the UK called migrants. Um, people who don't look like us, people who don't sound like us, for those who are the indigenous. And it's really difficult. But along the line, having to wait through all these many obstacles, I got busy. I started making family. I had one child and then two and then three. So I've got three children. And during the time I was mothering and seeing how best I could, second, I could circumvent all the obstacles and still get into Korea, because I love Korea. I love Korea. I just wanted to go to work, wear some lovely button up shirt and lovely shoes and go to work and do optometry. That is what I love to do. My son was three years old. And at this point we had moved to a place called West Yorkshire, which is, further away from London, which is more cosmopolitan, which is where I would see people who look like me or sound like me. And this is when my son will come back from school and say, I'm the only brown boy in nursery. I did not understand what that meant. Because when I was growing up in Ghana, I was not the only brown girl. But I was quite determined to understand what he meant. So I'll ask him more questions. And then I said, what about the other children? And then he will say, they are all peach. It became even more confusing because this was a reality that I did not know. I, I, I did not grow up in a place where I was in the minority of the minority. I did not know. And so I was really more interested in, in, especially as a mother, what I wanted to do to solve this problem. See, the more I listened to my son, I realized that he was trying to communicate to me the stark absence of presence, identity, 
and representation at his nursery. And it's incredible. Me to, this, is, this will be the first time I also realized that I'm the only brown mom when I go and pick up my son. So it was important for me to really do something about this because I know what it, what, what it meant when you were growing up in a place where there was no presence for you, no form of identity or representation. And for me, that utterly defies what education and our learning journey should be. Because I say, when we go to school, our learning journey should always present opportunities as windows and mirrors. Mirrors for us to see people like us, who talk like us, who've got hair like us, who come from similar backgrounds like us mirrors so that when we read books we see ourselves when we read books we hear ourselves and windows so we can see others as well but quite often the education that we have been given and some of our children over here would only provide mirrors so we see the others and we aspire to be like them to talk like them to dress like them and I wasn't willing to go through that journey where my son was not going to see himself as somebody who mattered and could contribute to the world and the systems. And so I called my migrant friends and they had similar stories to share. Um, all of their daughters wanted their braids really long, like Isla Rose. They did not understand this Afro hair. And so I said, um, we need to go into schools. Our children did not understand the color of their skin, their hair texture, why we talk the way we talk, why our house, why our homes is always smelling of something spicy and the jollof rises everywhere. It, it, it's not, it's, it wasn't normal, okay? And we had to let them know what that meant. So I said, nobody tells us to tell, nobody teaches us to tell stories. When you grow up in Ghana, Nigeria, Gabon, DRC, Zimbabwe, Zambia, storytelling is part of your everyday life. That is how you grow. That is how you understand the world around you. So let us invade school and start telling stories. So we started, this was around 2017. And for us, the big opportunity is always Black History Month in October, where we go into schools and we just say, can we come and tell stories? But we will go to sleep, we will wake up in 2022, in 2020, and everything will change. Everything will change because a man we don't even know is murdered in America, a man called George Floyd. Suddenly, people were looking for us. They called us people with lived experience. So they wanted to gather our stories to find out how we had been um, disproportionately affected by COVID-19, how we've suffered racism through educational and healthcare systems. So they would look for us and in spaces where we had wanted to talk before, where we weren't allowed, now they will offer us seats to tell our stories. I was quite determined because many times I went to spaces looking like this and I'll be told, Give the African woman a place to sit. It's not yet time for the drumming, the singing, or dancing. But me, I can't sing. I can't drum. Neither can I dance. I was born with a serendipity of oratory finesse. I just wanted to talk. I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to steer conversations into the change I was hoping to see. That change that will come through me and not to me. So for the first time, the world will open its doors. But before then, we had seen how the storytelling had impacted our children and their schools. And we thought, why not hold a space where we would tell the story to an adult audience? What about our neighbors, the people we go to work with, the people we go to church with, the people who stand with us in the corridors waiting for our children's schools to close? What about creating a safe space where they would come and ask me, why do I talk the way I talk? Why is my hair this way? Um, why do I like colorful accessories? Just a safe space for curious minds to ask questions. But we were going to use storytelling. And so African Iwa was birth. But the incredible thing was, I did not know the African story. 
Because if you're like me, if you're growing up in Zimbabwe or Zambia, South Africa, when you dream of seeing the world, sometimes you dream of sitting on a double-decker bus in London or touching the Eiffel Tower or going to the biggest um, dome somewhere in Rome. You don't think of visiting the waterfalls somewhere in Zimbabwe. You don't think of visiting Benin. You don't think of going to Nigeria to touch the bronzes maybe. And so I realized I did not even know the African story. I just knew the Ghana one. I knew the story of Kente, but I did not know the songs of Baba Tunde. So we had to get it right. And this is where Afro bloggers came in. Um, we entered this space through an incredible young lady called Lindsay. And Lindsay, um, I think she's pursuing further studies somewhere in Asia. And this is where Lindsay will come in and introduce me to Benjamin and the meeting. And as of yesterday, we have held a space and we have gathered and curated 22 lived and living experience stories. From the comfort of my home, I've made friends and family with people in South Africa, people in Zimbabwe, people in Kenya, people in Uganda, people in Nigeria, um, Somalia, people I did not know, the DRC. I even know a man in Uganda in a small village called Kasesi. And when I've said that, people marvel because they don't think Kasesi has access to the internet, but it does. At the queer corner of his home, Bikeke joins us the last Friday of every month just to share in our sacred space. Um, we are still growing and we quickly grab the opportunity to be part of Winter ABC last year, where we commissioned that um, competition for you to write a story that begins or ends. Until the lion begins to write, the stories will always glorify the hunter. And for us, it was just an onerous opportunity and to just come into the space and ask you to do this because we are not waiting for when we have a lot to spare with the little we have, we still deem it important to come back and, and, and share with Afro bloggers. All these spaces and these countries I've mentioned that we've been able to go and bring stories has only been possible um, because of Afro bloggers. And, and to that, I wish to say um, thank you. Be to now pause here and um, possibly I will share um, the introductory video of African Iwa and what it looks like. And I'm sure some of you will see some familiar faces who have given us their time over the past two years just to share these very unpopular stories by some very unpopular people to the rest of the world. And a lot of these people have started their own learning, learning and relearning journeys because you believed in us. So, so it's interesting to see that uh, the people who end up being um, quite helpful, are always helpful wherever they are. So you'll see, we mentioned them like, yeah, Benjamin, uh, we've got Paulette, uh, we've got Lindsay. They're actually key members in, 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 in the Afro bloggers community. We see them, they step up, they help out. And this is also what I like that uh, we, we, we grow between so many things and so many synergies. And what starts off as just a small spark becomes something that you're surprised like, wow, that, that's, these guys are talking about me. That, that's me, wow, okay. <laughs> I thought I was just some a regular person who's just, yeah inobtrusively on the internet and just typing out my blog and suddenly <laughs> we've compounded it and there's so many people who are just joining and it's growing and people are inspired and they're starting their own things and like yeah you've inspired us to keep going and to tell our stories I want it so just hearing that you see uh one has this journey and they start off somewhere and two years later you are there and being talking about the progress you've made and how you've even be able to now define your space where you're like no this is where i want to be and you're, you're more forceful about your presence and what you want to be associated with instead of just being invited yet the one was there like no you we talked about this and we're not welcome now we are coming on these terms this is who we are now so thank you for sharing that thank you so much so this video i'll be sharing will be how we start our session at African Iwa all the time. And Beaton is important when I said that people were looking for our stories because this will not be the first time people have come to villages in Africa to collect stories. 
from cocoa farmers, from fishermen, from women who have gone through FGM, from peasants with urbanism. They will write reports, they will write books, they will launch the books. The books will always be told, the books will tell stories, but always in the third person. We wanted to create the space when you came to tell your story was I and me and when I was and when I saw. We wanted it to be personal. And so when we've always told a story and the persons who have brought us these stories, and the credible thing is we use photos as well as oral narration. And uh, you might be wondering, is just people using their cameras to take the photos? The photos sometimes are blurry, but the magic is not even how visually they look. It's always the story behind the photos. So what we wanted to do now, my grandmother said, which meant if you do not tell your story, be sure someone else would and they might not tell it right. We wanted to immortalize the seemingly ordinary people who had come to share their stories with us. So at the beginning of every session, the first five minutes is our way of saying thank you to all 22 persons growing and counting who have gone lent to get us the stories and even some people whose photos are not here who have helped in our storytelling journey and have contributed immensely into the process so at this point i would like to share with you what we call stories of the storytellers thank you Sewan kasawutri wa ye yiwe yiboni. In another breath, if you do not tell your story, be sure someone else would, and they might not tell it right. For centuries, our stories have been untold, mistold, and interpreted and misinterpreted through Western lenses, resulting in the historical distortion and marginalization of our narrative. My name is Afrikaniwa and I was born a storyteller just like my mother, my grandmother and their mother's mother before them. For us, we hone in the Asian tradition of storytelling and as custodians of the sacred core, we believe the human story should be central to our understanding of the world. Stories told underneath the moonlight, by the fireside, to entertain, reprimand, train, teach, correct, and preserve our rich culture and heritage. But today, I'll tell you a story, a story about my grandmother, Akusuya Onyamaka, the one woman ensemble, the one whose name meant God has spoken, the one who truly spoke the oracles of God, the one on whose tongue lived oracy and literacy. She cladded her body with stories, strung parables like pearly beads to adorn her waist, myths and fables nested in her silvery grey hair, idiomatic expressions she wore like trinkets, proverbs were the palm oil with which she ate her words, psalms and songs lingered on her breath, and to me she would pass on a priceless piece of family early priced far above rubies, emeralds, opals, or any other precious mineral. The incredible gift to tell a story.
so I continue to tell these stories because our stories are best told by us. Stories to celebrate Asian traditions and provide modern solutions. Stories that nurture and power, build confidence and promote resilience. Stories to remember the unremembered. Stories to tell, retell, write and rewrite ourselves back into history. Stories changing the narrative and owning our narrative. Stories which become our shared story, our shared history and our shared humanity for when a people are forgotten their humanity is lost i am the story of the lived experience and my name is africaniwa my lens our story the last friday of every month this is how we begin our stories and this is how we honor um, the many stories we've had growing up and the many people who come and share into the space. When we wanted to speak, they told us no to come when there was drumming, singing and dancing, but not all of us can drum, sing or dance. So today, if they want our stories, we will hold the space, we will charge them, they will pay, they will come and they will listen to the stories. So if you've been following African Iwa, when we hold exhibition, we advertise and put it on Eventbrite. And without any shame, fear, or apology, we say, if you're coming from Global South, Global South meaning regions in Africa and Asia, admission is free. If you're coming from Global North, you pay us five pounds and Eventbrite will charge you 98 pence for admin cost. So five pounds, 98 pence. And people have been coming and they've gone back and we've challenged them. We've challenged them to give up some of their privileges because sometimes people don't even know what privilege is. I'll show you what privilege is. Privilege is when you live in a country that can only grow roses in the summer, but throughout the year you go to the shop and you can buy roses because flowers have been flown in from Kenya. Privilege is when you grow up in a country when you live in a country that does not even grow bananas, but January through December, you go to the shop and you can buy bananas because bananas have been flown in from Uganda. That is privilege. Privilege is if 129 years, people in my family have been tilling and toiling the soil, growing cocoa to be used as dessert for the tongues of European and don't they have not even seen how cocoa looks like in the port. I've never visited a cocoa farm. But they can tell you for three or five or six generations, my family has been making um, chocolate chip cookie. We've been making chocolate cake or chocolate bread. That is privilege. So now we tell our stories and we use them as a tool for social change and social justice. Where others have taken our stories and we do not become co-authors, now we become authors of our own story. And this is what African Iwa is all about. So we'll begin with this beautiful video. And quite often we have a man in the tribe who is called Muintumbo, who will come and do some special things just to say that the space is sacred. And indeed it's a sacred space. Because in a sacred space, you listen to understand seldomly do you listen to question. In a sacred space, you journey into the awareness of awareness. And you're quite careful to say that people who practice FGM are primitive. In a sacred space, you begin your learning, unlearning and relearning journey. And this afternoon I'm honored to ask Muntumbo to come and do one of his things to make this space sacred. So Muntumbo, if you can hear me, over to you. I'm going to ask um, one of our expert witnesses who has also shared the space with us a few times um, briefly to describe and tell us briefly what her journey on African Iwa has been like. 
So she will largely be speaking for the community and the families in the diaspora and what it's mean, what it means to them or what the session has meant to them the past two years when we have held the space and shared with them. So Nanesi Kessler Hayford, if you can hear me, um, Tribe Suman, today you're an expert witness. Would you like to briefly share your experience with African Iwa? Yes, African Iwa. Hmm. I can only say that I am ever so grateful that I got invited onto African Iwa to share that space, the sacred space where you can be unapologetically yourself and not fear having, having to be wrestled to the ground because you're a five foot, eight inch, you know, African woman, tall African woman, and therefore you're feared and thought of as, as being um, an aggressive, angry woman. Um, just like Adele, I've been disrupting places for years. And yes, I'm very unpopular in, um, you know, com uh, community settings. And this space has been a breath. You know, you're able to take a breath because you know you're in a space where People are, are like-minded. Yes, we we have our um, you know our different abilities, our different um, talents, and what have you. But we are all on a similar path. And for me, I think this is a space that needs to carry on, and it needs to be passed down to the next generation as well, for them to know that. They are safe to speak and air their, you know, their voices need to be heard. And, and I can only say that <laughs> Africaniwa has been, in some respects, a saving grace as well. Because when you reach a certain age in UK, you are cast aside put on the rubbish heap waiting to die, you know, and he here I'm able to carry on with the um, God-given um, talents and creative things that, I, you know, I've been given. So thank you, Africa Nua, and thank you for inviting me onto um, Afro bloggers because I, I love to write and I need somewhere to, to um, you know, put my work where, it's not going to be criticized and thrown out. I would love, uh, you know, <laughs> to have, uh, um, yeah, a criti I would love the work to be critiqued. However, not told that this kind of writing is not what we need. So here I am. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, thank you, Nancy. And um, at some point, I'll let Beaton come and give reflections. Afro bloggers is always open doors um, to people within, out in the diaspora as a safe place for digital storytelling. I think that it will be a great place to share some of your stories. Um, um, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Wintembo is here with us. Um, Wintembo? <clears throat> if not, I'm gonna ask Leo. Um, Leo just came in um, for the first time on African Iwa last night. And it's a series of conversation when we are telling stories and the stories are coming from Namibia. My body clock, my whole circadian clock is tuned into Namibia. So I'm waking up and I'm calling people on Namibia and WhatsApp and sending long audio notes and they are listening and making sense. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. And it's a lot of conversations to get the story told. And believe me, it's a lot of commitment. And this really means a lot to us. So the person who became my best friend the past few days was Leo. Um, we started conversating about um, last night's exhibition and regarding images that we needed from the waterfalls, Masio Tonya in um, Zimbabwe. And he was incredibly instrumental in getting the exhibition um, with regards to images from Zimbabwe. So Leo, um, briefly as an expert witness, would you like to share um, some of your thoughts um, being on the session last night? 
Hello, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm assuming everyone here is uh, well acquainted with uh, Beaton. Uh, I'd, I'd want to give a background story of sorts, um, dating back maybe to five years ago. That's when I started uh, my blogging journey. Um, he is the one who actually introduced me. I'm yet to meet him, but <laughs> Um, I was in Zimbabwe by that time, and um, someone introduced me to someone who then introduced me to to Beaton. So I called him the the blogging Malume. Um, mm. Malume translates to to uncle. He <laughs> he is that one uncle that um, uh, the blogging uncle, as the E streets refer to him as. Um, he's that artful uncle which every delinquent high school scholar would want to have at their disposal. That Malume would come to represent you at a parent-teacher meeting without uh, your actual parents' knowledge. But yeah, uh, I mean, he gives blogging and other life advice for free. He, he has been winning awards and stuff like that. But um, from, from um, 2017, we had a small group of bloggers, which we called Blogging Daba, that was in Zimbabwe. Then um, I emigrated to South Africa, where I'm staying in Cape Town at the moment. And um, I was then introduced to Afro bloggers. Then now I'm um, being introduced to African Niwa. Other than that, I was also uh, introduced to Writer's Space Africa. And through these blogging and um, African storytelling platforms, um, I was approached by uh, the Southern African Times um, to, to have a column on their, on their um, uh, newspaper. So I write for them. Had it not been for these blogging platforms, uh, I wouldn't be um, in that, do, doing that um, job at the moment. So uh, la last night um, when I participated in the African New um, um, two-year anniversary uh, meetup, I was really enlightened, particularly um, there was a group of people who broke uh, colonat with everyone. That was amazing. That was really amazing. And it, I'm always a custodian of um, African culture. Um, I believe in um, restoring or rather, uh, rather uh, making sure that we have our um, cultural values really maintained and passed on to, to younger generations. And um, in my presentation for the Mosia Tunia, I, I mentioned that time deals with almost everything. We need to give time some time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the time has come for that narrative to, to change really because um we were told um david livingstone discovered victoria falls but when david livingstone took his voyage to africa he got there but uh the falls were already there <laughs> um, and um according to um historical um evidence that is that was put forward he was actually told about the smoke that thunders, the Mosia Tunya, but he chose to ignore it. And for quite some time, he did not visit the actual place. And then he went back to um, to Europe and, come, and came back. And by the time he came back, he was the biggest um, explorer in, um, in Britain at the time. And that is when it was really beneficial for him to actually say, I, I've discovered this and I'm going to be naming it um, after the reigning Queen of England. And that would make sure that he was now in a position to, to get as much traction as possible. Had it been around this time, he would be getting the tweets and the retweets and a lot of followers on social media. <laughs> but yeah, back to the, um, to the presentation from last night, um, it was really um, an amazing um, platform to be on and contribute towards. And uh, I, I'm glad to be part of, um, it's, it is a wonderful time to, to be alive and being part of these mm -hmm. um, initiatives, which are great. We need to, to maintain our, our narrative and to correct it wherever possible.
thank you again for having me. Thank you very much indeed. So this will be Hexpress Yourself. This will be the first time we'll ever be introduced to beating and Express Yourself was trying to explore the history of Afro hair. And this was the first time we ever met beating. For, my, for us, the story is never complete. And when we tell it without mentioning Beaton's name, um, quite often when we've told the stories, we say schools and corporate bodies and places who are looking for diverse storytelling or a diverse approach to dialogue and conversations can invite us to start storytelling. Um, you'll be surprised how many people in the UK have had to leave jobs or change jobs because their hair was deemed unprofessional. And um, how many times our children have been sent on because the Afro hair is too big and people in the class cannot see the board. And so for us, it's important that we are able to tell these stories um, using this very creative and innovative means of visual storytelling, just using ordinary photos. This will be the first time we met this man called Benjamin Musun Jufu, and he came to contribute when we told this story um, the scramble for Buthurki. Um, this story sought to explore um, elections in Africa. Um, elections in Africa has a lot of strings um, that are pulled out of the continent. And there are people who always push the agenda to serve their needs. And this story captured um, elections in Uganda, I think about two years ago. And this will be the first time um, we met um, Benjamin. You're also familiar with Polet. Polet did something really extraordinary. She traveled 12 hours by road to meet these women, the women in the village of Imoja, the village where men are not allowed. So 12 hours by road, Polet left her home. She went to sit on the equator. She went by the fastest river in Africa and she went to Imoja village she set up a Zoom meeting and face to face by the power of technology, we spoke to these women and listened to their story. It's better than YouTube, believe me. There's an actual Zoom meeting where you can ask questions in real time and receive real time answers. Muintembo, if you're ready, over to you. And then shortly afterwards, I shall hand back to Beaton. Yes, Muintembo. <laughs> Do never be here in your money, yellow, yellow tabalama cham, balamaya. So we say when the great king Basagan Amperana war visited the royal palace of his eminence, na dominant when the big goo. The people gave him a warm welcome. The young ladies ululated at the peak of their voices. The young men danced in full gallantry and glory. At the end, this great king was offered cola nut and alligator pepper right in a golden calabash. Yet, in the tradition of African cultural mannerism, he who brings cola brings life. The cola then must be broken in a spirit of peace so that the soul of the guest may be at ease. For no man knows the intentions of his brother. How much more of a visitor? Yet, they say when the monkey chops, his brother baboon must also chop. Therefore, in the spirit of unity, I have come to share with you all my integrity. May the gods of the land do, but cause each and then everyone to prosper. May their rains shield you all from sudden fear. May prosperity and integrity be but our very identity. Mintonbo, the oracle of the messenger, I have spoken. May my words never be broken. Let he who has an ear hear and liberate his soul from fear.
Thank you very much indeed, Moon Turnbull. And um, then you'd have no idea the number of people who've asked me. So which school did you attend with Moon Turnbull? I don't know Moon Turnbull from anywhere. We've met through the virtual space of Africaniwa and his family, his family. Several nights we've sat on the phone and we've created content together. And Leo, when Leo wrote that piece yesterday, it was Moon Turnbull who went to the studio to record. And you're hearing people going to take photos and people recording it, probably thinking African Uwa must really be reimbursing them. No, no, we are not funded. We are not funded. That's a difficult thing. And for me, it's just humbling enough for people to give us their time, especially, and their resources. At best, we have compensated people with small tokens for the internet but nobody on African Iwa has ever been paid for their time, which means that it's not really for everybody because some people cannot afford to give us their time for nothing. And we are hoping that as we grow, we'll be able to compensate people duly, fully for their time spent. And for all that volunteering, we do not take for granted. I say that you give me your time, what can I give you? Okay, it might mean that we write a letter introducing you as a volunteer. It might mean that we also put your name and open a door of opportunity for you. And this is what we're saying. When I've been invited to places, I say, don't invite me if you're not willing to have all the over 50 something countries in Africa come along with me. Because when I go, I go with everyone. This is the first time when Turnbull will come to the tribe and we will tell a story called Ancestors Untold. Ancestors Untold. The story came from a museum in Ghana called Inchinchim, where we have um, the sculpted bust of a lot of our foremothers and fathers, persons um, who were forcibly taken away um, during those times, um, the slave enterprise, the slave trade enterprise time, and. Um, these were people who were forced from their homes. And today we remember them and tell their stories in an exhibition we called Ancestors Untold. And it was utterly beautiful sharing the space and working with Mwin Turnbull. Thank you, Beaton. Um, it's important, it was important for us if we were going to hold the space and say unity and diversity for people to feel comfortable as well as uncomfortable. And the past two years, I have come face to face with what it really means when you say unity in diversity. Unity in diversity, which is our tagline, and these are is the ethos that underpins everything we do. For us, unity and diversity simply means that very uncomfortable things will have to learn to sit beside each other. Uncomfortable things like the boy who came out gay yesterday and the man who is yet to unlearn homophobia. Uncomfortable things like the woman who is visibly Muslim and the other woman yet to unlearn Islamophobia. Uncomfortable things like the descendant of the oppressed and the oppressor. So we have a lot of white people in our space who dare to come. And for them, it means different things. I, I keep saying African Iwa means different things to different people, but underpinning whatever the reason is, we are proud to hold a space where uncomfortable things can sit together, have very uncomfortable conversations. And in the end, we somehow agree on a commonality. And um, people have come because they know that there'll be very good music or poetry. Um, they've come because they're going to discover an African artist for the first time. They've come because they just love to hear Muntembo do his poetry. They've come because of the image. Some have come because of the conversations. We've had people from very um, academic background like Baba Buntu sharing the space. We've had just ordinary people like cocoa farmers, persons with urbanism come and share the extraordinary stories. And we've also had very young um, narrators who have inspired us like Treasure, a 15 year old girl somewhere in Nigeria, who wrote an exam last year, a history paper, and question number 26 was asking who discovered River Niger. She chose Mungu Pak because this is what she's been told but she wrestled with herself after that exam. And she was wondering, how can somebody 
come all the way from Scotland and discover this river. And this is what inspired us to tell the story. So inspiration is always coming from different places, but it's never fictional. It's always stories of the lift and the living experience. And sometimes when we have to tell the story, we reconstruct it, but it's always come from a place of presence, identity, and for us is a way of representing it back to the bigger community. So I'm really pleased for the first time outside of Africaniwa to share with you um, this exhibition. We gathered and curated, um, spanning storytellers from Uganda, Ghana, um, Zimbabwe, Nigeria. Isaiah was the main co-producer of this exhibition. And I know Isaiah also shares in the space of Afro bloggers. Isaiah, if you're here, please do well to drop your hello in the chat so I know you are here. And he helped instrumentally to get the images and, and, and all the storytellers who shared in the space wrote their own script, which we were honored to have Wintembo read. And so with outstretched arms, I would like to invite all of you into the awareness of awareness, into a story we call, Who Discovered Mungu Park? I'll go ahead and share briefly. Good morning, class. Good morning, Madam. How are you all doing today? We are fine. Thank you. And you? I'm equally fine. Thank you all. Okay, so as part of our history lessons today, who discovered River Niger? Yes, you? River Niger was discovered by Mungo Park. That's brilliant. Clap for her. Yes. Please, madam, if River Niger was discovered by Mongo Park, who then discovered Mongo Park? <laughs> by the traditions of our fathers, they taught us that he who steals his neighbor's freedom only fills his life with boredom. It is just a matter of time. In 1906, the British Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, clearly demonstrated his arbitrary and underinformed knowledge of the motherland at the signing of the Anglo-French Convention on the Nigeria-Niger boundary when he said, and I quote, we have been engaged in drawing lines upon maps where no white man's foot ever trod. We have been giving away mountains and the rivers and the lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediments that we never knew exactly where the mountains and the rivers and the lakes were." Unquote. But what the fathers and the mothers could not do, their sons and daughters will surely live to do. Kebungla ebungla, what is ours is surely ours. Time deals with almost everything. We just need to give time some time. And the time has come for the narrative to be rewritten. When in 1851, David Livingston first arrived in Makololo territory, what we now call Chobe, in the company of the hunter William Oswald, he seemed to ignore stories of the great waterfall that Chief Sebetwane of the local tribe referred to as the smoke that tended, Monsieur Tony. He did not continue further to see the magnificent river that created the falls, which is rather odd for the most celebrated explorer of the time. We do have to wonder why Livingston delayed getting to the falls for so long. By the time he did, he was on his second expedition into the South Central African interior and was by then the most famous explorer in the British Empire. Only then would it benefit him to make his discovery, quote and unquote, known and named after the Queen 
of the English monarchy. Then again, the Tonga people who have lived in the Zambezi Valley for many centuries clearly knew about the great chasm and its billowing plume of spray in their midst since it has been the source of many maids handed down through the generations and the time has come to correct these maids nalubali is what our forefathers called it lake victoria is one of the largest fresh water lakes on the planet and maybe even in the milky way galaxy it is shared by tanzania uganda and the kenya it was of such wonder that the first europeans had confused it for an inland sea today the water body takes its name from the legacy of the british empire its current name is after queen victoria from the explorer john hanning speak the first britain to put down its detail in 1858 while on an expedition with richard francis burton it has several native names given by the people of this land but in central uganda the ganda people of the bugandi kingdom referred to it as nubali derived from lubali a spirit that is worshipped and esteemed by the people who live around the lake the water body was of such wonder in the african great lakes region hence being likened to the gods themselves nubali four names laced with history on it appellations minus the glare of flamboyance chosen by elders of Abrao, Wujian Abrao, Ya Abrao. Thank you, Arthur. So this, this is what an evening on African Iwa will look like. As a beautiful introduction, honoring all the stories we have done. I introduce the exhibition. Um, we speak to the people who have come to share their stories, like Leo. We go into the exhibition and it's just the photos, beautiful music, the story behind it, and everybody goes learning something. And Beaton, you'd be surprised when you ask people, what did you learn? I mean, this video now, people will hear for the first time that somewhere in Africa, even children clap rhythmically, you know, that, 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 that. Somebody has just come for that. For the first time, somebody is enlightened because they will know that somewhere in the world, when children are born, they are given Christian names, which they will take to school. And in the house, they'll be called something else. And some of these children will grow up and realize that, oh, my Christian name was no Christian name at all because my name is Agatha. And Agatha is not even a Christian name. So African Iwa means different things to different people. And right now, perhaps I would like to invite all of the community. Um, if you came with us on this journey into the photo slideshow, you had the story, you saw the videos, you had the audio. What did you learn? Um, to share his, his reflections on his journey with African Iwa. Isaiah joined us when we told a very unpopular story. It was an exhibition we called does tradition have to be so painful? This was a story about FGM, and it was Lillian who came to share the story. Lillian joined us from Kenya, and she um, identifies herself as a survivor of FGM. Um, sometimes we tell our stories, we sigh because words fail us. Sometimes we cry, and sometimes we laugh. Um, Isaiah, briefly, I'll just ask you to share your experience um, joining us on African Iwa as someone who came in to feed us from Afro bloggers. Over to you. Thank you to Adele. I, I, I'm wishing we took a look at us breaking today also. <laughs> um, the first time I joined um, African Iwa, um, the word African Iwa means a lot of things to different people. Mm -hmm. like, to me, as a Yoruba boy from Nigeria, it means we are Africans. Mm. Not to the 
that Africa and Iwa means another thing to them. I was like, wow. <laughs> I, um, Africa and Iwa is uh, um, the event emanated from Nigeria. But I got that she's from Ghana. So if somebody is not telling our story, mm. people somewhere else will be telling that story differently. I might be the victim of that story. Indeed. So, personally, I don't have much to say, but if one thing has touched me, it's the FGM, the Female Genital Mutilation Event. The exhibition changed my perspective about women. In fact, a lot of things changed. And I think I remember I wrote, I blogged about it. And a lot of ladies were questioning me, why did you have to write this? Why did you have to do this? This is the practice, this is the culture. And to today, I always ask, should our culture be painful? If it's a culture, if it's not painful, then it's honored one. But if it is painful, should we continue doing what is painful? And they said, probably because I'm not a woman. I said, okay, no problem. Yeah, my from Africa, Niwa, that's, FGM and the likes of things like that to today, uh, our culture should not be painful. I'm coming back to who discovered Mongo Park. <laughs> we've explored, we've gone to people, we've met people. But Aniwa um, is an inspiring um, hub, which you, it will make you go to the, the, to the level you think you can't go. For me as a person, I am so engaged with so many, a lot of things. But coming to Africa, Niwa, you need to do something for the good of the old cause and for the good of Africa. With my language from um, ben, ben, Benjamin knows about this, I used to say Africa first. And no matter what I'm doing, if I got the call, Africa, Niwa, Isaiah, you need to go and do this. That is Africa first. And that is what Africa means to me. Um, just before we go, I like to say that um, when we were asked to show our screens and then I just saw um, your smile and then that of Nanesi's smile, they were like, they were so, so inviting. And then all the other, I mean, besides what we do, we have a, a bunch of handsome gentlemen and then beautiful ladies in this very um, space. Indeed. And the, last, the last thing I say before we go is that, you know, when I say, um, yeah, punctuations, paragraphing, and then stuff. Please, um, it is just like the case of Mungo Park, which have been the bone of contention um, <laughs> for the past like almost three, uh, three or two days now. <laughs> write what you want to write, you know. <laughs> so when I told, um, I told a younger child here about this, and he said, "Okay, so he wants to enter the contest in his native Dagari language." Oh, wow. I said, "Nobody can read uh, your language." He said, "Yes." I sort of want to write my stories in Dagari and post it. I said, okay, so we'll see about that. This is utterly amazing. And that's yes. what some people have said. And um, this is what people have meant when they've said we should decolonize the language, the art, the writing, the spaces. And so when you don't know how to speak Dagari or Dagati, you will learn. Otherwise, somebody else will be there to read it. Because sometimes English fails me. English fails me quite often. And that is when I come up and say, My eyes are as red as the blood of the horseshoe crab. Thank you, Munjabur. <laughs>